in queuing a kernel. So, uh, do we have everyone still? Do you think, Rod, we're, we're okay to go? Yeah, I think, yeah, uh, crack on, yeah. Can I, can I just have a very basic question? Yeah. This is Lucien. Um, so, I, so what is then the role of uh, SQL targets? Because you specify that at compile time. I suppose it builds the kernel for the CUDA, but then you can actually, with the filter, you can switch what you want. So if I don't specify that one, it means that if I change the SQL device filter to be a GPU, that means I'm not going to have the kernel build, so I suppose you can't run it. Okay, so using SQL targets, you can specify multiple SQL targets. So if I wanted to, I could compile for every conceivable backend, and I would be producing device code for every or device IR for every conceivable backend, and then you could choose at runtime. So the um, the compilation and the device selection at runtime are very separate. You need to make sure it's the user's responsibility uh, to make sure that you have the correct device code before a certain device is chosen at runtime. And right, you can do so that's just, you want. that's just to build the infrastructure and then at runtime you decide what you want to use from that infrastructure. Exactly, 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 yes. Okay, so now when I got the errors, I was able to uh, run on the host, but I got errors uh, on, on the device. <laughs> that means it, it, it was uh, an error with whatever GPU I was using. Exactly, exactly, yes. And you can actually see that your, sorry, this is Lucian, is it? Yes, yes. Yes, yes, sorry. You can see that your, your error, um, you know, is an is a error that's being passed by the plugin interface, the, the okay. Pi CUDA. Pi CUDA. Uh, so this is relating to the backend. I, I'm not entirely sure if uh, this would change if you're using an sbatch um, script. Maybe there's something got to do with the permissions of your, of your account, uh, okay. potentially, I'm, it, I'm not sure. Or potentially the GPU on that particular node. It could, yeah, yeah, it could be, or yeah, so maybe um, maybe the, if you run NVIDIA SMI or or something, you might see that there's a really, you know, serious job yep. happening on that. Uh, okay. But I'm, I'm, not, I'm not entirely sure uh, yep. that would, yeah. Good to okay. understand. Okay, thank you. Brilliant, yeah, thank you. Okay, so I'm going to crack up. Okay, so first kernels. Okay, so again, uh, sickle, C++, but with, you know, offloading. Okay, so learn, learning objectives. Learn about queues and how to submit work to them. Okay, so someone very, very um, uh, astutely uh, asked the question, how does this map to a CUDA stream? At the moment, one-to-one. -one. In the future, it's not going to be one-to-one, -one, hopefully, because that will allow um, for more concurrency. Um, so learn how to allocate transfer and free memory using USM. So we're going to breeze through a lot of different uh, functions um, for USM. USM is unified shared memory. So this is a way of dealing with memory uh, that involves usually explicit allocations and uh, freeze and sometimes transfer. It's not always. OK, uh, learn how to define kernels. Learn about the rules and restrictions on kernel functions learn how to print from kernels to the console. This is very, very useful for debugging. So the queue. In SQL, all work is submitted via commands to a queue. The queue has an associated device that any commands in queue to it will target. Okay, so when you construct a queue, it essentially gets some device by some manner. It might be uh, a default thing that you can specify with <coughs> some device filter, or you could uh, explicitly ask for a GPU. You can also write your own device selectors, which is outside the scope of uh, this, but you could feasibly, you know, choose a, a device that's only a CUDA device that has a certain um, uh, string in, in its name or, or something like that. You can defi define your own ways to select devices. So there are several different ways to construct a queue. As we say, we're going to uh, default construct one just because it gives you a lot of flexibility uh, at runtime you can choose devices so this will have the single runtime choose a device for you and you can you know override this using your device filter as we saw 
So work submitted to a given queue can be executed in any given order. This is uh, important uh, in general when we're dealing with SQL. The queues are not necessarily in order. They can be executed in whatever way the runtime thinks is optimal, uh, the scheduler thinks is optimal. Uh, as we mentioned earlier, at the moment, uh, because we're dealing with a queue mapping to a CUDA stream, this in fact doesn't really, um, CUDA streams are in order. So at the moment, uh, queues with the CUDA backend are in order, but this is liable to change. So it's it's good to pretend that they're out of order and that we explicitly specify that they're uh, that one thing follows another. So it is necessary to define a given task's dependency. So the things that we want to, the, the events that we want to wait on for before the next event happens. So we can call wait by saying, okay, don't do anything on this until this has happened. Or we can, when giving a task, when uh, uh, adding a task to a queue, we can say, don't do that until this event has finished, that event has finished. Okay. And SQL events are returned from tasks. Okay, so when you enqueue a task, you get an event. And then when you wait on that, you can wait on uh, the task or the, sorry, the event or the actual queue itself. So constructing queues. So uh, here's a, a default queue. So we've actually already kind of glossed, or we've already gone over this very quickly. Um, and then here's a, a queue with a uh, GPU selector. So then as we saw, this will throw a runtime error if no GPUs are available. Uh, this is relatively straightforward. So in SQL, there are two models for managing data. Um, the buffer accessor model, we're just gonna mention this because we don't actually have time to get into this today. And unified shared memory. So unified shared memory involves explicit allocations, freeze, um, sometimes mem, mem copies, but not always. <coughs> So the model that you choose can have an effect on how you enqueue uh, kernel functions. We'll see that in a bit. So for now, we're gonna focus on the USM model. Uh, so you need to be familiar with, um, like this is a, you need to know that this is a thing in SQL, but we're, we just, we're, we're not gonna cover this today, um, maybe in a future workshop. So there are different ways USM memory can be allocated, host, device, and shared. So we're gonna focus on explicit USM with shared and device allocations. Okay, so here's a little table. Uh, this is from the DPC++ book, which is very good, recommended. So when you malloc on device, that pointer that's returned is not accessible on the host. If you try and dereference it or access the data within that allocation on, on host, you'll get, um, you'll get a, a seg fault or, or a, a legal access error. Um, it is accessible on device, okay? Uh, if you do a host malloc, it's accessible on the host and also on the device, and it's located on the host. Shared, um, I, it, I, I, it's not recommended necessarily to use a, a host malloc on device. If you wanted to share an allocation between device and host, it's better to use malloc shared and this is accessible on host and device, and it will use the underlying uh, CUDA API, uh, say malloc manage, which will allow you to essentially use the same uh, pointers on device and on host, and then it'll migrate data in between. <coughs> so malloc device, so this is just, so you have two versions, you have a C version, this returns a void star, or you have a, a templated uh, C++ version, so depending on your uh, your poison, uh, yeah, they do the same thing. You can just pass in a template parameter, maybe a little bit neater if you're um, if you prefer C++. So again, this is uh, only accessible on the device. Any pointer that's returned from this is only accessible on the device. Uh, so both these functions allocate the specific specified region of memory on the device associated with the specified queue. So you need to uh, pass in a sickle queue. Okay, so it needs to be associated with a device. So a queue is implicitly associated with a device and a context, um, but well, most importantly, a, a device. 
And uh, as a result, it, this needs to be part of the malloc device because you're the, the malloc device because you're specifying what device you want it to happen on. So it's only accessible in a kernel function running on that device, very important. So kernel code, again, this is the, the device code essentially. So the only bit in our uh, sickle code that is gonna be run on device is the kernel function. So that's the only place where we can access this. So we get a synchronous exception if the device does not have uh, USM device allocations. We don't need to worry about that today. And it's a blocking operation. That's uh, sort of important. A lot of operations are not blocking um, in Stickle, but this, this is blocking. Okay, malloc shared. Yeah, this is convenient. Uh, uses malloc managed. Um, and then the pointer is accessible using, um, okay, is a malloc in queue and run asynchronously or is it blocking and just queries a queue to find the associated device? Uh, it is not run async asynchronously, it is blocking. It is blocking. So it's it would be equivalent to enqueuing it to the queue and waiting on it immediately, but we haven't gone through waiting yet, but um, yeah, totally blocking. Uh, and all of these are, are blocking. Yeah, all of these uh, malloc x uh, functions are blocking. So this is convenient. Uh, we can make a single allocation and then access the, the pointer from host and device and then the, the API will migrate the data back and forth. Um, not as performant as doing uh, explicit mem copies because of the mechanism, the underlying mechanism to transmit data relies on page faults essentially. Um, it relies on one device asking for the data and then the API realizing, oh, it's not there yet. Now we need to go get it. Uh, Whereas if you tell the, the, the API to send things explicitly, then usually if you're doing a lot of mem copies, uh, it'll be more performant. <coughs> and yeah, uh, could a malloc managed? Uh, yeah, potentially slower. Okay, um, free. So this actually should be sickle free, uh, the sickle namespace, sickle free. Um, so in order to prevent memory leaks, USM device allocations must be uh, freed by calling the free function. So this should be sickle free, this is in the sickle namespace. Uh, if you just use a normal free, which is part of your normal uh, C++ um, library, uh, then you might get an error. Uh, and I think in fact, you will get an error in DPC++. <laughs> okay, and this is also blocking and the queue needs to be the same. Yeah, that maybe goes without saying. <coughs> Okay, uh, mem copies. So this is important if you're using say mal malloc device. So let's just say that you allocate uh, some space on a device and then you also have a vector. You want to copy the uh, elements from the vector over to device. You, you need to explicitly copy the, the, the memory over. Um, yeah, this is probably straightforward. And this same uh, function is used regardless of what direction you're going. And so this, the desk might be on the host and the other one on device or vice versa. Um, yeah, uh, copying between devices, uh, between queues is not necessarily allowed unless they share the same context. But that's uh, something that we're not going to cover today. At the moment, we just want to think about host to device, device to host. Um, Another important thing actually that I didn't mention in the previous ones. Um, no, sorry, that's my shared yet. Sorry, okay, no copy. So we have this standard vector of dependent events. So we can actually pass in a vector of events that we're waiting on um, so that this will not happen until we get the, the go ahead from the previous events. Okay, and this would return an event as well. So actually we could take this event uh, and then submit it to the dependent events of the next kernel and so on. This is a, a neat way of doing things, uh, which we'll see in this exercise that's coming up. Okay, so pretty much all of these queue member functions uh, return an event, pretty much, I, th I think all of them do. So it's a good idea either to wait on them or pass them on to subsequent events as dependent events, okay? We'll see how this happens in the, Next exercise. So memset, this is just setting um, things in a particular 
uh, allocation, setting setting the value for numbytes, um, and uh, yeah, and then fill as well uh, initialize the data with a recurring pattern. So these are also asynchronous. So anything that returns an event is asynchronous, and we need to pass these events on as into dependencies of other things, or you can explicitly call wait on them, and then nothing will happen until uh, that has returned. Okay, so now here's the good stuff. So in queuing a kernel, so again, these return events. So a kernel can consist of a single task. This is carried out by a single thread, a single work item, uh, and this will be some sort of a lambda. Uh, we'll see some examples of this in uh, the next few slides. You can also um, submit a kernel as a parallel for, and this will be uh, executed over a certain range. So we're just gonna deal with a simple range now. So this is some um, either a one or a two or three dimensional object, which says, yeah, let's have five in the X direction, 10 in that direction and hundred in the Y in the Z direction. It's easiest just to start off with one dimensional, obviously, and then you only need to think, yeah, let's do this for 10, 24 uh, work items and so on. Okay. Um, so kernels take the form of function objects or lambdas. So lambdas, as we say, are used a lot in SQL. Um, yeah, quite convenient, if you ask me. Um, the queue provides member functions which allow you to invoke a single task or a parallel for. Okay, so there are actually, later on in the workshop, we'll see that there are other ways of enqueuing a parallel for um, or a single task, but these are kind of the most maybe straightforward, short cutty ways. Um, and then these can only be used when using the USM uh, data management model. Yeah, that's, that's correct. Uh, we don't necessarily need to worry about that at the moment. Okay, so what does it look like? So basic SQL application, which used uses a shared USM and invokes a kernel function with a single task. So shared USM, okay, this is blocking obviously because, so it's, it's blocking. And another reason why it's blocking is because it needs to return something that is not an event. Okay, there's no way that malloc shared can not, that there's no way that malloc shared can return an event. Therefore it needs to be blocking. I think that's the, the rationale. So the, we're uh, allocating space for one of type T, uh, associating it with this particular queue. And then we're initializing it on the, on the host. Then this is our kernel code, dereferencing it on the kernel code, the exact same pointer. And then we're just gonna square it uh, and that's fine. And then return it. Okay, so this is totally fine. We don't need to do any, um, so we need to wait on the event that's returned from the single task, but then we can just return the, the value. It'll, it'll automatically get the value back from the, the device uh, shared memory. <coughs> okay, so we, all we, we allocate USM device memory by calling malloc device. So this is a little bit more involved. So instead of just calling uh, malloc shared and letting the, the API do all the work with pointers for you, um, we're going to explicitly uh, malloc on device, which means that we need to mem copy as well. Okay, anytime we want to do anything on on device, so we're mem copying uh, to the device uh, pointer whatever's in X. I'm not sure what's in X, and then just size of T. We're going to square it, and then you need to mem copy it back. Okay, so actually, I'm not sure if anyone is astute enough to notice something that might not necessarily go right with this this particular code. <coughs> Missing dependencies. Exactly, exactly, yes, well done, well done. Yes, yes, well done. Yeah, brilliant, yeah. So essentially, the, the, we're, a queue can be out of order, okay? So there's no saying that this, you know, will happen after that, will happen after that. We need to actually define the dependencies, okay? So we'll, we'll go on to that next. Yeah, well done, okay, aha. So the easiest way to do that is just call wait. <coughs> call wait, then it'll happen kind of in order or you know, we will wait until uh, each is exited, okay? 
a little bit more elegant if we can use explicit dependencies from events because it means that we don't have to have a linear uh, DAG, a, a kind of whatever, completely one-dimensional DAG. This is a little bit nicer. Okay, so we have E1, which is returned from the mem copy. Okay, so this is your dependency that you're explicitly naming in here. Okay, and then we have an event which is returned from the single task, and then we wait on that. So this is our dependency in this one. Okay, and then you uh, get the event. That should just be a single dot. Uh, that's a typo. Yeah. Okay. So this is a little bit nicer because you can actually you can kind of you can have a, a, a complex DAG. Okay. Let's see something. Okay. So with just wait, you're forced to wait one after the other. Whereas if you uh, explicitly name your dependencies using events and some vector of dependencies then you can essentially have a, a, an arbitrarily complex DAG, okay? And this, this will, you know, make a lot of difference in terms of writing performant code. Um, yeah, it, concurrency is obviously very important. So yeah, we need to do this. So then this would depend on event one. This would also depend on event one. They would have no dependency on each other. So they can happen um, synchronously, or not synchronously, sorry. They can happen concurrently. Um, and then this de depends on both of them. Yeah. <clears throat> Kernel function rules. So they must be defined using a C++ Lambda or a function object, uh, cannot be a function pointer or a standard a std function. So this is, as I said earlier, uh, so you need to use a C++ Lambda or function object. I would personally recommend uh, Lambda, but it's a matter of taste. Uh, must always capture or store members by value. This is very important. So when you're defining your single task, you need to use by value. Okay, you can't pass things by reference into a into a kernel because, well, certainly with um, say with uh, malloc shared or or whatever, you might be dereferencing things in the wrong way. You want to pass them by value, and that will uh, adjust them to be submitted by the uh, so that they're appropriate to be run on the device. Um, yes. So you can name your Lambda if you want. You don't actually have to. So this is a DPC++ extension. You used to need to name your Lambda, which we'll go through later. It can be really useful when you're profiling, but you don't have to anymore. Um, so cyclical kernel function names, uh, they need to be unique as well, but we don't need to think about naming them at the moment. So cyclical kernel function restrictions. So no dynamic allocation, okay? No dynamic polymorphism, no function pointers, no recursion. Okay, these are sort of, you know, set in stone. Um, kernels as function objects. Okay, so I can, I can, uh, um, so this is uh, with a lambda. Okay, just some lambda, which is being passed. Uh, we see by value. Okay, but we can also use a function object. Okay, just the same, it's okay. Okay, um, and then you would you would construct that function object within the within the submission of the the single task. Um, okay, kernel printf. This is the best thing in the world. Um, if you're doing any debugging, it's it's amazing to be able to. But no, it's it's expected to be able to printf from inside the kernel, uh, as it is with CUDA and for instance. So yeah, GPU single task. Hello world. Brilliant. Okay, uh, implement a SQL application, which includes, okay, so, sorry, um, there's no question slides here, but does anyone have any questions? I just put one in Slack about return type. Uh, okay. Can a sickle kernel is that um, uh, that can a sickle kernel in the form of a function object return something, or does it have to be void, like CUDA kernels? Uh, that's a good question. Um, so, it, yeah, Gordon. Oh no, sorry. In general, I, I'm I'm not actually sure if it needs to be void, but certainly like the value would be would be lost. Uh, Gordon, is that correct? 
That, that, that's right, yeah. I'm not entirely sure if the implementations enforce it, but it's, it's, it's expected that the kernel functions are void. Any, if you want to return anything from a kernel, it has to be done through a, either an accessor or a USM pointer. It's, there's no return type. Yeah. You, you definitely try it out. I'm sure that um, potentially you can submit. Like, there's no reason why you necessarily want to. Like, it's not like a kernel or a function object that you pass into a kernel. It's not like you want it for another purpose as well that needs it to return something other than void. But yeah, you can try it out, try it out. But in general, yeah, void. Yeah, I believe the spec says it should be void. But I don't know what the implementations will do if you if you try yeah okay any other questions so you showed single task as the beginning example are there also um, multiple tasks or repeated tasks or what are the other uh, related stuff to this yes 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 exactly yes brilliant question um so yes yeah, so this is uh, we're, we're using single task at the moment but uh the other one for parallel uh, is parallel four <clears throat> so this particular exercise we're just going to be dealing with single tasks just so we can get our head around submitting things, getting events, so on. But a parallel for can be defined on a range. Um, and this is just a simple global range, but we'll see later on that there are more um, complex ways to construct uh, a range, which you know is similar to the idea of, uh, say, threads and blocks and you know grids in, in CUDA. But this is just a naive global range saying, how many work items do we want? Uh, we're not worrying about, you know, uh, work group size, block size. We're not worrying about that uh, in this particular instance. But there, we'll we'll get onto that later. But for the moment, we're just looking at single tasks just to get our heads around some of the other concepts. Um, yeah. How do you pass uh, arrays as arguments or as captures? So, sorry, say that one more time. Arrays. Oh, can we can pass them as as arguments? Yes, yeah, certainly. Yeah, certainly. Yeah. So it's it's easy to to pass them by captures, but um, yeah, you can pass by arguments as well. Yeah. Okay. So no pointer, double pointer stuff like in C or something crazy like that. No, 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 no. Uh, like these these kernel submissions are not going to be. Um, they're not going to be altering the the say the underlying pointer they're just going to be acting on the data at that pointer so you don't need to um pass things well actually sorry i should say things need to be passed by value so if you're passing say a pointer um as an argument you need to make sure that you're not passing it by reference because we don't want the possibility that it might be altered uh by the kernel i'm, I'm that might throw an error i'm not sure if you try to do that uh compiler error but yeah, always by value um, in general. And it's easy to do that with just a yeah, value capture. Yeah, captures are easy, yeah. How do you pass a vector, for instance, std vector? Right, a vector, a std vector, okay. So you don't necessarily want to pass a, a std vector to your, um, into, uh, so the, the std vector lives in host memory. So there's no way of accessing that from device so from a kernel um, if it's running on a device. You need to make sure that you allocate on the device, you send the data to the device, and then when you're finished doing whatever you want to do, you send back the results. You can't access, um, you know, allocations that are on the host. So a std vector is a host allocation, even though you know it, it doesn't necessarily call itself that. Uh, you need to make sure that anything that's being used on the device uh, has a device allocation, has a shared allocation. Um, using the buffer accessor model, there's a, a quite a neat way that vectors uh, create buffers, which are then accessed with accessors, but we're not covering that today. 
Yeah, I think generally the, the problem with using std vector is that um, it can kind of uh, dynamically reallocate the, the memory, which obviously that, that done on a kernel is, is, is going to be problematic. Um, std array is, is a, is, um, can be used. I think there's quite a few places where we've seen std array used uh, in a kernel. Um, but um, I, I think generally you wouldn't you wouldn't want to use the vector. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. We might um, start looking at the next exercise. Yeah, um, I was going to say that um, obviously we've been going for a little while. Uh, we could get people to work on the exercises and potentially have a bit of a break if they want to get away. Yeah, um, exactly, yeah. What, what time do you want to restart? Uh, you. Personally. I think, um, I think we were scheduled to restart uh, a little while ago, but we can shift things forward a bit. Yeah. Um, up, to, up to you, really. I, I... I guess let's give people, uh, say, 25 minutes to do the exercise and then have a bit of a break. And then that takes us to Brilliant. Uh, 10 past, uh, 10 minutes past um, 11 Pacific. Yeah, so we'll have a break at 10 past. Uh, no, we'll, I think do the exercise yeah. and people can have a break. And have a break. As and when they want. And we'll, we'll restart at 10, 10 minutes past. Uh, um, Brilliant. Sorry, it's past 11. Sorry, I'm trying to work out time zones. I know, I know. Yeah, yeah. sorry, it's yes, yeah, seven hours difference. Or no, sorry, no, six hours. Six hours. Okay. Okay, so let's have a look at this. Um, this. Okay, so this is uh, our latest um, task. Okay, so essentially we want to, let's look at the reading as well. Okay, so instructions. We want to allocate two ints on device A1, uh, or A is one and B is two. Okay, so we need to mem copy to initialize device memory for A dev and B dev. Um, so, yeah. Now we want to use a single task to multiply A dev by two. Use a separate single task to multiply B dev by 100. Then use another single task to add the result of both together and store the value in A. Then we mem copy the value back to host and print to standard out. Okay. So the challenge here is either to call wait between each thing, uh, which would give you this linear um, execution graph, this linear execution graph. But actually we can see that in this case, uh, tasks two and, or sorry, three and four, are completely independent of each other. So they should be able to happen at the same time. So if we can name our dependencies in a way where these two don't depend on each other, and then the final event does depend on these two, that would be nice. Uh, not essential, but this is a nice, yeah, a nice use of a very, very simple DAG. Uh, so then the dependency will be on this for both these two. And then this has a dependency of both of these. And then the mem copy will have a dependency of that. Okay. So we're just using single tasks and single values. This is just a single int, single int. Okay. And then we have a few pointers here. So construct queue, allocate device memory. So uh, we can use malloc device or maybe malloc shared if you like. Um, mem copy. Uh, and then free memory, single task, so on. Okay, and obviously you should uh, try and get this this answer, hopefully. For a uh, malloc uh, device, is there a default property list for the last uh, argument? No, no, no. Uh, sorry, there, the, so the property list is, uh, the default property list is, is empty, yeah. Um, so you don't need to worry about specifying a property list. So these are, they're kind of there just in case at some stage it becomes a good idea to um, to implement properly lists for these things. But I, I actually don't think that there are any defined properties uh, that you could pass into 
valid device. So I, I correct me if I'm wrong, Gordon. Yeah, I don't think there's any properties available that you can use at the moment. Um, generally, most SQL classes can be constructed with a property list, but it's in a lot of places it's there for sort of forward um, compatibility with you know potential properties in the future. Things like the queue and in context have properties, um, buffers have properties. But some of the classes kind of have the capability, but there's nothing specific you can pass them. Uh, this is a stupid beginner C++ question, but when using the template syntax, do you want uh, int or int star for the um, the one that goes in the angle brackets? So this is int, this is int. So the int will return an int, uh, will return an int star. So you're allocating, you know, a certain amount of ints, and then you get the pointer back. It has to be int star, even though it's just a scalar, just a single uh, integer, because it's a pointer, a device pointer. Yeah, you're you're still asking for a single pointer, and then you get the point. Sorry, you're still asking for an allocation for single int, and then you get the pointer to that int. So if you pass in, say, int star, then you get an int double star out. Do you know what I mean? Yes. So the type name will be just int. Yes, in the angle, in the brackets, yeah, in the template brackets. I have kind of a general question. That's all right about circle. Yeah. Um. So it seems like a lot of the, uh, uh, it, it seems like it really relies on building a, a graph with the, the right dependencies for, for each um, kernel in, in the queue. Or, or, and that, that seems like an easy thing to mess up, just like to forget to add one dependency and then you're left with some very difficult to de debug um, race condition of some sort much later on down the line. Are, are there any strategies to, sort of help do this correctly? Uh, definitely, if you're just trying to get code working, just use weights. If you wait, then this will enforce this, this linear, uh, whatever, one dimensional chain of execution. Uh, uh, that's a, a, an easy thing to do. Whereas if you try and do the more complex things, maybe this is uh, a, a little bit more subtle, more nuanced, uh, but it can give better performance. Uh, theoretically at least well yeah theoretically um but yeah in general if you're trying to kind of remove elements of asynchronousness uh just call wait because that will just you know it'll it'll wait on whatever it is so you know in fact things will be happening sort of synchronously you might say so yeah that makes sense thanks and i guess relatedly do, do you find that you know, medium complexity like scientific SQL applications do end up with very complicated branching graphs, or or is do you find that more of the computation is uh, Im embedded in the kernel such that you do have a pretty simple flow? Well, personally, I've been working on say some deep neural networks libraries recently, which is uh, what I'll use. But yeah, definitely there is an element of concurrency, um, which, you know, would involve this kind of a branching sort of DAG, but um, it's it not necessarily the case of, it's really like implementation, or it's, it's really uh, application dependent. Uh, I, I'm not, people, at the the labs can maybe answer this question better than I can. I think from from my experience, I think the the generally when you see the, um, like the DAGs like this is when you're doing sort of um, copying data whilst doing compute at the same time, so like double buffering and things like that, or you know using multiple devices and doing load balancing and things like that's where more complicated DAGs tend to come up. Or if you're sort of doing interop in between cycle kernels for things like you know, and uh, the Do you have to use printf in device code or you can uh, pipe to STDC out? Uh, so uh, printf, printf, not standard CF. So there, there are other things called SQL streams, which allow you to, to pipe to um, a SQL stream, which is declared 
in um, to a to, well without getting into too much depth. There are mechanisms by which you can use kind of streams, but it's easier to use printf. Maybe to to go back to the dependency chain, I know you will not talk about buffer and stuff, but one of the big advantage of buffer is handling all this data dependency for you automatically, right? And I think it is one of the nice uh, advantages. Like in theory, the runtime can be smart enough to do all this kind of interleaving and uh, just put the correct uh, dependency automatically for you. And I think it's a good, uh, uh, a really good thing to use, but porting your code using buffer is uh, more involved indeed. Yeah. Absolutely. Yes, Thomas, yeah, I, I, should, I should have mentioned that. So the other memory paradigm, the other memory model, the buffer um, accessor model, it pretty much does all this stuff behind the scenes for you. So you don't need to worry about it at all. But um, this kind of explicit dependency naming, this is maybe more akin to other, um, yeah, other APIs, like maybe CUDA or something. I think you mentioned sickle wait. So wait is inside sickle namespace, but why is the slide 24 saying, uh... It's a method as well of a single task. Sorry. Uh, sorry, say that again. Sorry, can you can you repeat that? Yes, that one. Why is it dot wait? Dot wait. Okay, so essentially this returns an event. This queue submission returns an event, and then you can call wait on an event, which, um, yeah, it means that nothing else will happen until this is returned. So you can call wait on an event, or you can call wait on a queue. So in this case, we're calling it on an event because this is the thing which is returned by this this um cube dot single task if yeah if we look at sorry if we look at uh single task single task single task returns an event a single event that is a single event Oh, yeah, nice. Yeah, okay. So actually, maybe this is something that um, may be related to what you're saying, but um, let's just say that we wait and we want to assign that value to something. So wait actually doesn't return an event. Okay. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what it does return, in fact, but I've got a feeling it might be void or something. Um, so the sickle spec is your friend for these kind of questions. Um, so it ends. Or sorry, yeah, the error, the error would suggest that, um, yeah, it returns void. So wait returns void. Yeah, so that's a, that's a nice, uh, that's a nice bug. Yeah, I think Wait. the. Sorry, yes. Go. Yeah, the, maybe the difference between the two are the granularity, right? Where queue wait, you wait for all the commands that you on queue into the queue to finish. Where if you wait on an event, you wait only for this event to finish, right? So it is a, the little uh, difference between the two. So if you are in a need order queue in a, like a CUDA way, both are totally equivalent, right? But if you are more in the out of order way, uh, they are totally different. It's not the same granularity. Absolutely. Maybe it is, yeah. So what happens if you have, um, you pick up the event with a variable and then you are gonna call wait? 
um, you assign it. Um, how, so where's the weight actually acting? It's on the CP on the host? Um, so the weight, yeah, the weight is happening on the, on the host. It's essentially, I, I'm assuming that it's an interaction with the, the plugin interface, um, which interfaces with say the CUDA, the CUDA driver in this instance. And it's saying, okay, um, on the host, let's wait until we get uh, the plugin interface saying, yeah, kernel completed success. Um, so yeah, we can wait for an event, which would be, you know, an underlying CUDA event, or we can wait for the queue. And if we're waiting for the queue, that's um, waiting for essentially everything in the queue to complete. So if you have, um, if you want to execute multiple copies, for example, and the order doesn't matter, you could potentially just uh, just launch a bunch of mem copies, and uh, and it doesn't matter. Like you can just you don't need to wait for them. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. So if you do, let's that's a really really good question. So if you do say you know a million mem copies, you just need to wait on the queue after you do all those mem copies. And then yeah, you don't pass to... that point, but you are not interfering to, in order to to disturb how exactly. they, they're actually doing the copies. Exactly, but in fact, you don't you don't need to worry about the individual tasks, right? Because the queue has a record; it, it kind of has a, a yeah. hidden record of all the tasks, sort of um, that you can just wait until all the events have completed. And um, if you want to pin the memory uh on the device how do you achieve this one um, over here is when you actually uh, create the queue i guess or the memory when you actually create the memory with malloc device i guess so when you say pin the memory well there are multiple ways in which you can allocate memory on the device right yes 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 of course yeah so one sorry, of them is sorry, actually sorry. when you fix the memory right uh, sorry, when you when you're setting the memory or when you're when you're copying to the memory. So you allocate. Okay. Go so, ahead. I was going to say I, I could probably answer to this. Um, so at the moment, uh, sickle sickle standard spec doesn't have uh, an explicit way to to do pinned memory. Um, but because it's it's it can kind of vary from one uh, kind of back end one part device from another. Um. But generally, if you allow the sickle runtime to allocate the memory for you through like not device, not shared, um, and as long as sort of your the, the kind of the size of memory you're allocating is sort of along the lines of what you'd the kind of that platform would recommend, you know, in terms of you know the size of memory, the like cache line, like multiple of the cache line, that kind of thing, then that should it should allocate it in memory for you. So it's kind of a quality of implementation. Detail, I think there has been some interest in a way to kind of properties to be able to explicitly request that um, allocations are pinned. And um, so that's mm -hmm. something that we may see in the future, but at the moment, there's not an explicit way to, uh, to do it. It's more of an implementation detail, quality of implementation. I see. So, and I see. Most, most implementations will have, uh, like, will have some, some sort of guidance in, in their documentation uh, and how to do pin memory and zero copy. Oh, so it might actually depend on the actual implementation of uh, of SQL. Yeah, it, it can sometimes. It's usually kind of sim similar kind of guidelines, but it can vary um, between the uh, implementations. Um, but I think we might see kind of a, a more standardized way of doing it in the future. It's definitely interesting that. And maybe one general comment is because you do just CUDA call at the end, you can just use NVPro for whatever tracer you like, and you can verify how they map, right? So this is also the good thing with all this uh, offloading model or something like that. It's like you can always check what the backend is doing. So at the end, is nothing is magic, and you can check if indeed they pin memory, for example. No, oh, yeah, um, that's a really good point. What, what happens if you run this one, let's say on a KNL? Um, uh, so you might have the CPU, you might run on KNL. So then you also have different types of memory, right? Where, how do you control uh, which, or even on the GPU, right? Like if you are using texture memory, um, how, how do you control where it goes? So, 
so this is it's it's easier done with accessors so using buffers and accessors um you don't have the same control uh when you're just dealing with uh malloc device and, and, and that kind of thing as to where your your memory is actually what, what kind of memory that you're using um so for that the buffer accessor model is better uh, mm -hmm. we're going to be looking at using CUDA shared memory in, I think, the, if not the next one, then the one after that. So you'll, you'll kind of see um, how this is done, but it's using yeah, buffers, accessors. Well, not necessarily buffers, but accessors. And um, if you're going to run this code on the host after that, um, essentially uh, it's going to skip, I guess, this, this step of copying the memory or what does it do or it does a local copy to the memory or in in which particular example so so you you have this code that you produce but then you can run it on the host like just the uh, oh yes CPU. Sorry, sorry, sorry. yes 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 yeah and so what what happens if you do a yeah, mem you, copy and it yeah you do a mem copy does it do anything or it just skips it or um so if you do a mem copy i would i would imagine it skips it i'm i'm not entirely sure i think it's it's i i would imagine it's defined by the implementation and what exactly dpc++ does in that case uh i'm not sure gordon can you so is the question what happens to the, the host device? What what happens yeah, for allocations and mem copies where they're not needed? Essentially, where you know you choose the device to be the host device. Are, are these just simply kind of emitted, or do they default to like a host alloc or something or host malloc? And um, so I, I believe with uh, with USM because it's explicit. Um, it will it will still perform the copy even if it's sort of strictly unnecessary. Uh, with the with the buffer accessor model, it's a bit more forgiving. In the with the buffer accessors, rather than sort of um, explicitly kind of prescriptively saying what you want to be allocated and copied when, where you're kind of describing the um, the requirements in terms of kind of what memory you want, where and when. And then the runtime kind of does the efficient thing for you. So with buffers and accessors, it's a bit more forgiving. USM, you have to be kind of careful that you're not kind of doing copies unnecessarily. Yeah, it it certainly wouldn't have any detrimental like impact to your your code anyway. It it would yeah maybe be wasteful, but it, it, presumably you're using it for debugging anyway. So yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, um, I think we might start uh, the next section. Uh, maybe I'll, I'll go through the, the example very quickly. <clears throat> okay, so yeah, essentially, um, yeah, here we have A and B, uh, default construct queue, uh, allocate memory on the device. Okay, just size one. Mem copy to both. Okay, we're getting the return values from both. Okay, um, not necessarily um, essential. We could also just do something like a, you know, a general q dot wait here. But yeah, well, for the sake of this, we've done this. Okay, this has has a dependency on e one. Uh, this single task has a dependency on e two. Okay. We're also getting the events that are returned from these. And then we have another single task, which has both of the um, individual single tasks as a dependency. Then we're just going to add the two together. OK, and then we can call wait on that if we want. Um, and then mem copy back, wait. And then that should work. OK, and we need to call sickle free. If we don't call sickle free, if we just call free, then you might get an error. Um, OK, so. Let's just do that. Okay, go 
really switch. Spencer, you can do nice filter equals good at the middle of Okay, you can also do host and so on. 